My name is Marcel Bauer. I'm here in South Africa with a private anti poaching team, and we are now on the way to our first uh, deployment inside the bush. Next to me is Nico Mitter, and I will follow him for the next two weeks. You have been doing this for now four years, and you're in the private sector, right? Yes. Yes, um, so basically um, I've been working with rhinos for the last five years. I've had my own anti-poaching unit for the last uh, four years. Um, we don't only protect rhinos, but we also protect a general game, fauna and flora, which is basically the animals as well as the plants. Uh, we also protect the fish and the dams, so there's no overfishing that is taking place or any illegal activities regarding wildlife in general. Um, we protect them, uh, we stay within the law and we let justice take its course. So Nico, your job is pretty, pretty intense and dangerous. Can you please explain why are you doing this job and what does it take for? Okay, uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, basically, you have to have a lot of love and passion for the nature, for animals. You have to believe in what they stand for, for the good of life itself. Um, it's very, very difficult sometimes. You encounter very horrific scenes. Um, you see very brutal activities. Um, also, another thing is, it's very physical. You need to be strong not only physically but mentally as well to prepare yourself uh, it's very um, difficult to plan because everything changes constantly the animals change the type of environment change the weather changes everything plays its role um, in you trying to work as effective and if as efficient as possible to achieve your goal um, to catch the poachers or even to deter them so they won't be able to poach the animals um, that much. Uh, it's very difficult to keep them away as well. Another thing why I started this is from when I was a very young boy, I had a big passion for nature, for animals in general. Um, that also translated into the very active um, hunting community. Um, I believe hunting and conservation really goes hand in hand to get together. Um, from the weapon handling it translated into a more tactical situation. Um, because of personal reasons I had to start my own um, anti-poaching unit because of some of the animals that I have um, and that I work with uh, frequently and that led to us uh, growing as big to the point we are now um, being hired and rendering services uh, specifically to wildlife protection and the conservation of our natural habitats of our ecosystems um, and of our wildlife in general so what we are now doing here is to check the fences because all the poachers inside here um, have to come in and come out. So we have a lot of lot of fences here. We have to check. You see it all to be down. Some kilometers we have to check now. Um, so basically, we are busy patrolling the fences. Um, we have to keep an eye out for tracks, um, any tracks of human signs coming into the uh, premises or exiting the premises. Uh, signs of dogs, something that is unnatural. Um, also smell for dead carcasses. Um, also check if the fence is damaged anywhere um, because of human activity. They will cut off the wires using the material on the fence to erect the snares and the traps to catch the animals. So we have to monitor each and every place. Another thing is if animals fought and breaks the fence or damages the fence, we will lose animals from the property and they will escape. So we need to monitor all fences, all roads, each and every day. We are approaching 
the border fence between the informal settlement and the property we have to protect um, the risk is very high um, the cattle herders and people chopping wood people forging from the bush felt um, people that is taking stuff from the felt for medicinal use or witchcraft all of them will be definitely watching us seeing us monitoring us um, but there's nothing we can do we can only protect our area and make sure our property our fence our roads are not damaged or infiltrated so um, the land on the other side of the fence belongs to the people it's land that the government gave to the people to use in any way they want so basically this is private property it borders next to the governmental ground the farm owner is already spending a lot of money just to protect his farm um, maintenance issues like this makes our job very difficult to do our job as effective and as, as efficient as possible because on this large piece of land there's just too many entry points and too many places to cover um, I cannot have a ranger each and every hundred meters just standing there checking the fence waiting for something to happen so we have to be very active and cover as much ground as possible so we can get to places like this see if there's any tracks coming in identify the roots of the poachers and to deter them and protect our property so we just got back here to the vehicle now um, after we checked all the fences and i would say we had a lot of um, activity there yes also we had um, an unknown contact about 400 meters yes in front of us we had a sighting a suspicious sighting um, the suspicious silhouettes or identities we cannot identify because they were too far away around about 400 meters and they were moving very fast uh, close to the fence as well yeah. um, it also looks as if there was another uh, entity on the other side of the fence moving mm. moving with them so um, very suspicious uh, a lot of entry easy entry points yeah, yeah. Um, but we couldn't identify any spur as the terrain is very difficult with the rocks as well so you will only be able to identify very fresh spur um, also with no sun and the cloudy conditions makes it a little bit difficult to track as well um, and the wind as well with the grass brushing over the uh, surface of the ground floor yeah. taking away the spur very quickly um, but we'll investigate uh, where we picked up a spur in the felt yesterday to sweep for more snares. Mm. Um, so also it's investigate. So it's we, uh, but no. also investigate in the bush as we arrived there. Yeah. That dead smell. I exactly you said you smell something here. We'll, investi we'll investigate now. Uh, do some 360 circles sweeping through the bush felt right. in the game paths. Most likely, we'll definitely find a carcass. Okay, Nico, can you tell me shortly um, what is the plan here and where we are? Okay, so first of all, we are on a farm based next to an informal settlement. So basically the plan is firstly to establish the entry routes and the exit routes. The entry and the exit will give us uh, more or less a reference to where they moved through the bushes um, so we can more quickly and efficiently get to the snare and take them off as quickly as possible also plan more or less the time it takes them to put up the snares and do the work in the bush mm. and um, so we can establish a waylay okay and what is the most dangerous part here the most dangerous part is basically while we are taking off the snares because most of the time um, the poachers will be in the bush close to the snares with dogs waiting for the animal to be catch and um, 
if we pass there and they see us, they could ambush us. Uh, another thing is uh, we are not alone in the bush, not only with the poachers, but with dangerous animals as well. Uh, the animals might get a fright as we surprise them as the bush is very dense and very thick. Um, and they will most, most of the time when they are frightened um, do a charge on us. So we have to be prepared for that as well. Okay, so we are heading towards a very, very, very dangerous area right now. Um, as you can see, the bush is very, very thick. Um, very small game paths, which make it very easy for the poachers to ambush us, as well as the animals, um, because the animals get surprised as we come up, taking off the snares and tracking the poachers. Um, then when the animals get to fight, they will either um, do a charge or if we encounter a giraffe, for instance, while they are feeding in the treetops, uh, in the canopies, with their head above, um, they can kick us with one kick to the chest, we'll most likely die. Um, so we have to keep it quiet, be very vigilant, um, looking out for snares, signs of people, people, poachers trying to ambush us, as well as animals. Okay, so, as you can see, the snare is very low, close to the ground, underneath very thorny trees, right in the game trail. So the animal has to go down if it even puts his foot through or either his head. As soon as he tightens this, and the animal moves. It goes stiffer, stiffer, the wire cutting through the flesh onto the bone of the animal. The animal will get stuck and get caught, most likely be running around like this, tightening it all stiffer and stiffer until it's totally immobilized and then it will die. But because lack of food, lack of hydration or the poacher will still get it alive and butcher it alive. First one. Look inside to keep it stiff. So if this twig comes out like this, it will fall loose and the animal will miss it. Is it, is it a metal one? Yes, metal cable. Metal cable. They steal it from the teleco uh, telecommunication tower. Check how difficult it is to cut. Very, very tough. We came across a game path leading to this area where there's a lot of this acacia type of trees which is very high in nutrition um, even for the animals grazing in the felt. We came across a young impala swans which they caught in the snares in a matter of around about 20 square meters we found 
seven snares only in this little bush um, as you can see while they while they were putting up the snares uh, their dogs also cat, uh, caught a guinea fowl they plucked all the feathers and ate it while they were putting up the snares <laughs> So we just arrived at the watering hole, wanting to sweep, make sure that the area is clean as soon as we got out of the vehicle and took the first game trail. We picked up a spoor, we followed the spoor and we found our first two snares. Safer with the window down. <laughs> Poaching itself, what it means here in South Africa and also why do the people poach here okay that's a very important point um, the local people living in south africa they use the animal parts and poach to get the animal parts um, for the use of muti muti is like a type of a mixture of animal parts which witch doctors known as sangomas um, will make the people um, they would charge a lot of money for this and they would tell the people basically that um, that they have blessed the muti that liquid that they made for them from the animal parts and then they will be cured from very bad diseases like hiv cancer they also believe that they can be cured from poverty or bad circumstances um, they also use some of the parts for black magic to put curses or spells um, on some of the people um, but obviously that that's their opinion that's what they believe um, another thing is the demand for animal products um, in the asian market um, that's very high it's a very big problem. Um, it's not only concerning rhinos or rhino horn, but it's the pangolin, the pangolin uh, meat, scales, um, lion claws, uh, lion teeth, um, hides and skins, um, the feet of the rhinos even, tails. Um, they believe in general in Asia that it's a sign of wealth when you have rhino horn or use it they grind it up and they they'll throw it inside their drinks um, they believe it makes them very strong and show that they are wealthy among their friends um, they also use it for aphrodisiac uh, purposes um, which everything in my opinion is really not true because the rhino horn even the animals horns here the antelopes and stuff um, it's made of the same type of materials in our fingernails and hair which is keratin and um, so they can also put their own fingernails in this and exactly it <laughs> exactly exactly um, but again um, I understand sometimes it's difficult people are difficult in general to understand each other because it's their culture it's their tradition and to change that that uh, that one thing that they've been doing for centuries now exactly. will be very difficult for for especially the youth of the day to understand um, it will take a very long time to change that mindset um, poaching to give it a uh, 
definition in short is basically the killing of wild animals or wildlife um, illegally uh, when they are not on your premises without any permits it's mostly done very unethical unethically um, they kill the animals in very brutal manner um, most of the time they will just try to immobilize them or to constrain them by the use of snares or um, chop them with machetes or axes on the spinal area so they will be paralyzed or immobilized and while they are alive they will hack off the products and the animal parts that they want or that they need another big problem is the way they operate now um, they are very specialized syndicates um, so what they will do is like they will start with the animal that is more easier to uh, get a hold of or to kill poison the carcasses for instance if they if they shoot a rhino and take all the parts that they need um, they would poison the carcass so animals like hyenas vultures lions that pass by that uh, carcass and then they feed on it they will die from the poison as well then the poachers um, will have a lot of animal parts so they don't only sell it to the black market but they also sell it to the witch doctors um, another thing why they do that is if the vultures um, pick up a carcass they make a huge circle above the carcass and when we see a circle we know something is dead there um, so we will go to that scene and investigate and by poisoning the carcass and killing the vultures there will be no circle, no vultures in the air. Uh, it will be a very long time for us, most likely, to get to that carcass since the per uh, perimeters and the properties where we patrol on is very big. Uh, it's very difficult terrain as well, so you cannot have roads everywhere and do everything by vehicle. 80% um, of the work you have to do on foot, um, which make it even more difficult for us. But in general, like I said, the tracking is also a very big role. Um, you have to be able to estimate the age of the spoor. You have to be able to identify different types of spoor. Um, so you can know how many individuals um, of, are, are in the premises, um, maybe wanting to poach. Um, you have to be able to track them faster than they walk otherwise there's no no reason to track them at all because you have to track them at such a pace that you can come up close to them and have a chance to arrest them um, another thing that's also very 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 important is um, the type of tactics to use it all depends on what the poachers how many they are, uh, what they have with them, if you have seen them, um, if there are a lot of animals like dogs with them, um, what, what animals are on the premises that you protect, because that will also give around about an indication how heavily armed they are. Um, like for example, if it's rhino poachers, they are very arm heavily armed. Um, elephant poacher poachers are very heavily armed. Snare poachers um, could not be that armed in some instances, but again, they have a lot of dogs with them. They are not alone. They have axes, they have machetes. They may have small firearms to uh, fight us off. Um, so they want their products. It all depends on the situation, the environment, which animals you are protecting and where you are located. Today, I just want to s explain to you some techniques the poachers use uh, for anti-tracking to make it more difficult for us to find them or not to find them at all. They use these techniques to uh, slow us down and to get away faster. Um, they especially apply this when they have enough time. Um, so it's critical that we keep on pra practicing um, the techniques that they use so we can be more efficient when we're tracking them.
Okay, so the first one is just a normal spoor uh, jogging. So if you come and have a look closer, you will see that there's a lot of pressure on the front toe because of the way the human anatomy works, because of the way we, our balance works with our body. We lean a little bit forward, there's a little bit more weight and uh, pressure on the toe of your feet. Um, as you can see, I have my poacher shoes on. Um, so if you find a spoor looking very deep in front and light at the back, um, you can most definitely assume that this person was either jogging or running. Another thing, just to say as well, if you measure the distance from the one spur to the next spur, you'll see it's a little bit further apart than your normal walking distance. That's another way to identify that the person was busy running or jogging. Now I'll do the second one. As you can see from this one, um, not a lot of pressure. Pressure equally spread apart all across the spoor, which means this person was just walking normal. Um, the spoor is also not very far apart. Um, so you can, if you pick up the spoor, you can measure it by yourself. Obviously each human body uh, differs, um, but we all have a general um, uh, width that we our steps are apart so you can measure it for yourself and as you can see with the spoor pressures um, are spread equally apart all over the sole of the feet and you have a clear footprint of the whole shoe the next one I'll explain to you now As you can see this spoor, backtracking. Um, on this one, you have basically at the heel of your foot, a little bit of the soil or the ground or the material um, will be pushed back a little bit. Just that's an indication because you start with your toes, then the ball and then the heel is lastly on. And when you lift your foot up, moving back, you will always see, especially in deep sand like this, um, that the sand gets thrown a little bit to the backside. Also, you'll see the way he index his toes um, very deep, and then you get the, the pressure of the sole of the, of the um, rubber of the feet, of the shoe, um, equally spread apart, and then at the back, always that little piece of sand, little hill that they knock over. So the next one, um, very, very difficult. Um, obviously in the places where the poachers operate, there's a lot of animals, a lot of animal activity. The animals' tracks differ um, because in Africa we have a huge variety of species. So they try to mimic the tracks of an animal just to throw you off of their spoor, off of their route, or they usually do this when they change route or cross roads. Um, so you wouldn't see that there were any human activity and you'd think it was just an animal um, either that got hurt, um, limbing, or an animal that was chilling, or even like this, just walking around. So this one, they mimic most of the time like a zebra spoor, like the hoof part. Um, also when they turn their heels while they are doing this, um, it can sometimes look like an eland or a young buffalo spoor. So this is very difficult to track, very hard to identify. And usually you can only identify it if you can see clear markings of the print of the sole of the shoe. This one, um, they usually use 
to cross over um, a big open field um, where there's no grass, where there's only ground. So they will jump long distances, making tips with their feet as if there was animals running, um, especially antelope species with a little bit more narrower, smaller spoor. Um, again, mimicking the animals to throw you off of their route and also to delay you in the time tracking them so they can get away. Okay, so this one is basically the most difficult to track. Again, they use this um, usually where they put up a lot of snares um, to show that there was no uh, human movement or to sweep the um, ground surface completely. So either they will walk with a, a branch holding at their back, walking, uh, taking away their spoor, but you will see now um, it leaves big trails and if they use the wrong branch it leaves uh, behind a lot of leaves which is very suspicious and unusual um, and gives them away but if you're not aware of it you will never be able to track them another one um, where they walk and slap their spoor it looks like there was a lot of guinea fowl or pheasants or franklin fowl um, which also is very very difficult um, the very, very more advanced poachers that are, have been doing this for years um, use this method a lot. Um, you basically cannot track them. It's very difficult to identify because each branch's leaves looks different and will leave different types of signs. So there's not a specific tree or a specific brush or shrub that they use constantly. They will take what they have closest to them and just to do that as quick as possible and to leave no signs behind. Um, this is utterly the most difficult way to track and takes a long time to master this skill. Okay, so just to give you some tips on how to track what different types of tracking methods it is and just the basics to help you to track as efficient as possible. Um, you get a ground spoor, you get an aerial spoor and then you get signs. So basically a ground spoor is your most common spoor, the most common track is where you literally um, see the track on the ground and you can follow it. Um, the aerial spoor is when there's a lot of material covering the ground, leaves, grasses, everything. And um, the grass will most likely be like um, pushed over in the direction the person was heading. So the rest of the grasses will stay up straight and the ones in the middle where the person were moving will lie down flat. So then you have to follow that path of the grass where it's lying flat. The sign part is one of the most difficult parts in my opinion because it's usually in very very rocky areas or thick bush um, where the poacher moves through and for instance a uh, twig of a thorn tree hooks him and the thorn, the thorn tree's um, thorns breaks off or the piece of the bronze breaks off and you can check on the bronze it's still very very fresh very suspicious as well and they jump on rocks so you can identify if a rock was turned over um, again to identify and estimate the time of, or, the, or the age of the spoor is very very difficult that will take a long period of years to master because also each uh, area is different um, you have to think on all of the external um, factors uh, the climate everything the fog in the air rain um, the other animals uh, in the bush if they passed over the spoor ants dung beetles um, Another thing is a good reference point to establish the spoor, um, more or less, is if you see the spoor, you take your shoe, you step right next to it 
and then you compare the colors that the ground makes to the poacher spoor, to your spoor, um, and then you can get more or less a good reference on how old the spoor will be. Okay, so a very useful tip when you track, always try to have the sun um, in front of you, track towards the sun. Um, if you do that, you will see that the prints, the footprints that you are tracking is like standing out way more because the sun will make a little bit of a shadow on the, the sand edges around the footprint that at the position where you are viewing from now um, the sun is behind you which is very difficult and your shadow is also leaning forward um, that's why it's so difficult to see these footprints um, so if you have it from another angle you will see the footprints way way better so each morning um, each and every day actually we have to take the spoor of the rhinoceros to find their location and make sure um, all of the animals are alive in good health not injured um, also while we're tracking them and walking on the routes that they have been using throughout the night or until there were um, rangers with them on the last few moments, um, we have to make sure there's no poacher spur that's on their route as well, tracking them. Um, and then we, once we establish their position, we have to secure the perimeter around them for around about 100 meters circle and also make sure that they, there are no poachers who are coming close to them and um, have seen them to know their position. We just picked up the spoor, very fresh spoor. As you can see, try to mimic it, but they are just too heavy for us to get exactly the same type of soil but if I try very hard where the big male dragged his feet here this is very 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 fresh so we picked up the fresh poor we'll track them now to find their position We had just fed the rhinos. They are all very, um, very calm and safe. Uh, it's very good to know their location before the night starts. Um, so when we rotate shifts, uh, the next ranger won't take too long and won't find it too difficult and waste, waste too much time finding the position of the rhinos. Um, so we feed them as much as possible. Uh, they know their feeding times um, and that's optimal for, for shift changes. These rhinos are 100% wild. They are not tamed, they are not kept in cages. They are free roaming animals and um, they, are, they can feel that we want to protect them. 
they know we are not here to hurt them, we are here to help them, we take good care of them and we have a very good relationship with them. Uh, it's an awesome feeling. So after the last um, days, I really asked myself, will it ever end? All that poaching here in Africa, is there any kind of future for the animals? What do you think about? That is, that is very sad actually. Um, we are basically fighting a never ending war. We may win the battle for today or tomorrow, remove the snares all the time, keep on making arrests, but in the comparison to the people, the amount of people and the amount of animals we have, we will never win the war. The people are basically getting too much and the land is getting way too little for all of the people. The animals have no chance. They cannot go anywhere, anywhere else. Um, it's very difficult with our laws. Um, the regulations and stuff regarding the IUCN CITES uh, for the farmers, the private um, owners of the reserves, they are running out of funding. To be honest, it's only a matter of time that everything will be over. Not only for the animals, but then we will lose our all of our stuff that we are so proud of that makes Africa Africa. Our animals, our bush felt. It's very sad. Maybe it's also in the hand of the government because maybe there's um, a way to support, especially private owners. That is that is true, um, but that's a very sensitive subject. Um, the government already has its hands full. It cannot control even the normal resources of South Africa, the basic needs and has too much stuff they need to focus on apart from the animals. This is like on the lower part of their priority list if I can put it that way to be honest. So I have been here for now more or less exactly two weeks and the first thing I want to do is definitely to Thanks a lot, all the people here, especially Nico and his team, um, to having me here, give me the opportunity to make this experience, produce this um, documentary together. It's a big honor for me. So let's talk a little bit about my personal experience as a um, newborn here, the first time in Africa. The situation here is way more dangerous as I personally expected because it's not only the environment and the poachers itself it's nearly everything here we talk about dangerous animals we talk about all the bushes here all the trees all the plants it's like you walk through the bush and nearly every plant you you are touching tries to hold you back nearly every insect here is more or less toxic they're even looking toxic um, the bush is also very thick even when there are some poachers inside and for normal they are armed you have a lot of problems to see them it's really difficult because they can hide in the bushes they can hide here like you can see in the background in the high grass and it's only a matter of time until you run into some poachers and they have definitely the option to take um, the first shot to us and we have to live with this fact all the time 24 hours every time you are outside in the bush and that's really uncomfortable in my personal opinion um, the international support here should be way more because it's not really the big problem and the poachers here have two less people that's not correct they have a lot of really competent professional people 
but they have a problem with supplies and with um, equipment. That's the biggest problem here because it's very, very, very more difficult to get on high quality gear, like in um, Europe, for example. Um, so that's really something we should support the anti-Porsche teams here way more better to support their work and also to support the living animals here. My last point is to close this documentary now. Um, I really can hope all over the world that the people will have more respect for their environment and for the animals because otherwise I see here no future, especially in poor lands, dangerous lands like here in Africa, without respect to the animals and the environment and nature, I see here no future.